Hi, this is Dr. Bev Knox, your psychology exam study buddy. This is episode three, and we will be reviewing the scientific method and research strategies in general. Um, I will be going over information in detail in this episode. And in episode four, I will be going over the questions and answers for your psychology exam, specifically focusing on research strategies, how psychologists ask and answer questions. So in this episode, you'll get the theory, you'll get the information. I will help you to study to ace your psych exam. And in the next episode, I will go over um, basic questions and answers for, from a psychology qu a quiz bank, okay? Alrighty, so let's get started. All right, so at the foundation of all science is a scientific attitude that combines curiosity um, skepticism and humility. So psychologists aim their scientific attitude with the scientific method. And these are definitions that you need to know, okay? So the scientific method is a self-correcting process for evaluating ideas with observations and analysis. Okay, so the scientific method in itself is a self-correcting process for evaluating ideas with observation and analysis. So what is the scientific method? The scientific method is a self-correcting process for evaluating ideas with observation and analysis. Repeat after me. The scientific method, I want you to repeat this either out loud or in your mind. The scientific method is a self-correcting process for evaluating ideas with observation and analysis. So let's review some of the definitions. A theory is an explanation using an integrated set of principles that organizes observations and predicts behaviors or events. What is a theory? A theory explains behaviors or events by offering ideas and organize observations. By using deeper principles to organize isolated facts, a theory summarizes and simplifies. As we connect the observed dots, a coherent picture emerges. So, a theory of how sleep affects memory, for example, helps us to organize countless sleep-related observations into a short list of principles, okay? So, a theory is an explanation using an integrated set of principles that organizes observations and predicts behaviors or events. Let's move on to the word hypothesis. So a hypothesis is a testable prediction often implied by a theory. A hypothesis is a testable prediction often implied by a theory. So, no matter how reasonable a theory may sound, and it does not seem reasonable to suggest that 
sleep boosts memories, for example. We must put it to the test. So a good theory produces testable predictions called hypothesis. Such predictions specify what results would support the theory and what results would disconfirm it. So to test out a theory about sleep effects on memory, our hypothesis might be that when sleep deprived, people will remember less from the day before. So to test that hypothesis, we might assess how well people remember course materials they studied either before a good night's sleep or before a shortened night's sleep. The results will either support our theory or lead us to revise or reject it. So our theories can bias our observations. So that's one thing that we need to remember. So once again, a theory is an, ex an explanation using an integrated set of principles that organizes observations and predicts behaviors or events. What is a theory? That's right. It is an explanation using an integrated set of principles that organize observations and predicts behaviors or events. And a hypothesis is a testable prediction often implied by a theory. Now, one thing we have to um, do and know right away is what we call an operational definition. As a check on their biases, psychologists report their research with precise operational definitions of procedures and concepts. So what does this mean? Operational definitions are a carefully worded statement of the exact procedures. Now let me, let me repeat myself because it's so important that you know this. Operational definition is a carefully worded statement of the exact procedures, which are the operations used in a research study. So for example, human intelligence may be operationally defined as an intelligence test measures. What is operational definition? Operational definition is a carefully worded statement of the exact procedures, which are the operations, used in a research study. Okay, now, replication. Let's, let's move to replication. Um, using these carefully worded statements in an operational definition, Okay, why do we use them? Simply, so others can replicate, and replicate means to repeat, the original observations with different participants, materials, and circumstances. Now, if they get a similar result, or if they get similar results, confidence in the findings reliability grows. So it's a good thing if they are able to replicate your research study and come up with similar results. The first study in regards to replication comes out with a particular result. And when other psychologists, um, you know, replicate that particular study and come up with similar results, that's a good thing the reliability 
increases, it grows, okay? So replication is an essential part of good science. In psychology, recent replication efforts have produced mixed results. So what that means is that some psychologists would come up with similar uh, results, and that would be a good thing, and some would not. So replication is repeating the essence of a research study, usually with different participants in different situations, to see whether the basic finding can be reproduced. So what is replication? Replication is repeating the essence of a research study, usually with different participants in different situations, to see whether the basic finding can be reproduced. So now we're going to move on to the different types of research methods, okay? So we're actually going to compare the, the types of research methods. Now, I want you to think of research in three categories, okay? So there's three categories of research methods. And under each category, there's going to be examples of types of research, okay? So the three types of research methods would be descriptive, correlational, and experimental. Remember that. What are the three types of research methods or the three categories of research methods descriptive correlational and experimental descriptive its basic purpose is to observe and record behavior and how is it conducted case studies naturalistic observations or survey. Is anything manipulated in descriptive research? No. So descriptive research, its basic purpose is to observe and record behavior. How is it conducted? Via case studies, naturalistic observations, or surveys. Is anything manipulated? No. I will go into a little bit more detail in a minute, but I wanted you to just get a gist of the three major uh, research methods and be able to compare them. So again, descriptive research method. Its basic purpose is to do what? To observe and record behavior. How is it conducted? Case studies, naturalistic observations, or surveys? Is anything manipulated? No. The next one is correlational. Its basic purpose is to detect naturally occurring relationships and to assess how well one variable predicts another. So correlation research is to detect naturally occurring relationships to assess how well one variable predicts another. How is it conducted? Conducted. It is collected, it is conducted by collecting data on two or more variables. It is conducted by collecting data on two or more variables. And is anything manipulated? No. So just like descriptive, nothing is manipulated. So what is correlational research? It's used to do what? To detect naturally occurring relationships, to assess how well one variable predicts another. And how is it conducted? by collecting data 
on two or more variables and nothing is manipulated. Now the third is experimental research. So don't forget your three major categories, descriptive, correlational, and now experimental. So with experimental research, its basic purpose is to explore cause and effect. To explore cause and effect. How is it conducted? To manipulate one or more factors. So there we go. This is the only one that uses manipulation of variables, right? So it is conducted by manipulating one or more factors. And what is manipulated? The independent variable is manipulated. The independent variable. Okay, again, experimental research is used to do what? To explore cause and effect. How is it conducted? By manipulating one or more factors. What is manipulated? The independent variable. Okay, let's go more in depth um, in regards to research methods. So the starting point of any science is description. In everyday life, we all observe and describe people, often drawing conclusions about what or why they think, feel, and act. We do that, I, I do that, you do that, right? Professional psychologists do much the same thing through more objectively, remember what that word is, right? Objective versus subjective. We went over that in the last study buddy, um, you know, episode. More objectively and systematically. So objectively, again, is not, you know, they're not just stating what they feel or think about a particular subject matter. They're actually stating facts, whether it's through observa obs direct observation or other research that's done. So uh, these professional psychologists, how do they conduct this these type of research? Well, there's three. So under descriptive uh, research method, because remember we talked about there being three, descriptive, correlational, and experimental. So under descriptive, there's three. There's case studies, naturalistic observation, and surveys, or surveys and interviews. So a case study is an in-depth analysis of individuals or groups. A case study is a descriptive technique in which one individual or group is studied in depth in the hope of re, uh, revealing universal principles. Now, whenever you hear the word universal, like we just you know stated in this definition, the definition, it just means that it applies to everybody. Okay, whenever you hear, um, you know, for, for example, standards of beauty is universal. That would be wrong, right? Because standards of beauty varies based on culture. So standards of beauty is not universal. So in regards to a case study, a case study is a descriptive technique in which one individual or group is studied in depth in the hope of receiving universal principles, that um, these principles may apply to everybody. That is a case study. And a naturalistic observation is a descriptive technique. Again, it falls on the descript descriptive, not, you know, not correlation and not experimental, right? It's under descriptive. So naturalistic observation is a descriptive technique of observing 
and recording behavior in naturally occurring situations without trying to manipulate or control the situation. Now, this is this is a definition that you need to know. You will you will see this uh, word on most psychology exams in regards to research um, strategies. Okay, so the second descriptive method method records behavior in natural environments. These naturalistic observations range from watching chimpanzee societies in the jungle to videotaping and analyzing parent-child interactions in different cultures to recording racial differences in students, self-seeding patterns in a uh, school lunchroom, for example. So naturalistic observation, um, you don't manipulate anything, okay? So it is a descriptive technique of observation and recording behavior in naturally occurring situations without trying to manipulate or control the situation. What is naturalistic observation? That's right. It is a descriptive technique of observing and recording behavior in naturally occurring situations without trying to manipulate and control uh, the situation. Okay. So let's move on to the survey. A survey looks at many cases in less depth, asking people to report their behavior or their opinions. So questions about everything from sexual practices to political opinions are put to the public, okay? So a survey is a descriptive technique for observing the self-reported attitudes or behaviors of a particular group, usually by questioning a representative random sample of the group. So again, a survey can be done in, in many ways, by the way. It used to be, you know, you have people holding a clipboard, walking around, standing in a mall or a college or school or, or what have you, doctor's office, and, you know, just asking questions. But now surveys are done in so many different formats. For example, via the telephone, even on, you know, computers, you know? Um, so surveys are done in many, many different ways. But a survey is a descriptive technique for obtaining the self-reported attitudes or behaviors of a particular group, usually by questioning a representative, a random sample of a group. So now, what is a random sample? A random sample basically is a sample that fairly represents a population because each member has an equal chance of inclusion. So random, random sampling. So in everyday thinking, we tend to generalize from samples we observe, especially vivid cases. An administrator who reads a statistical summary of a professor student's evaluations, for example, um, is a great way to represent random sampling. And random sampling means what? A sample that fairly represents a population because each member has an equal chance of inclusion. So what do we mean by population? All those in a group being studied from which samples may be drawn. So what is a population? 
all those in a group being studied from which samples may be drawn. Okay, beautiful. Um, okay, so at this point, remember this. Before accepting survey findings, you must think critically. And that's something we spoke of in episode one, how thinking critically is so very important. You must consider the sample. The best bias or, or rather basis for generalizing is from a representative sample. We know that. You cannot compensate for unrepresentative samples by simply adding more people. Okay, however, however, um, if you are to review uh, results from um, from surveys, for example, it is much better to view results from a survey that was done on 10,000 people, okay, versus a survey that was only done on 50 people and you're trying to represent a, uh, a, a particular population. So it's much better if you have um, larger numbers um, in, your, in your population, okay? So what is a population? All those in a group being studied from which samples may be drawn. Okay, so that's good. So we just covered uh, descriptive. And don't forget again, desc descriptive methods use what? Case studies, natural observations, and surveys. Let's move on to correlational research. Now, so describing behavior is a first step towards predicting it. Um, naturalistic observations and surveys often show us that one trait or behavior tends to coincide with, with another. So in such cases, we may say, like, um, these two things correlate. And what does it mean? Um, there's a relationship between two or more variables. That's all it means. And you have to remember that, okay? So correlation is a measure of the extent to which two factors vary together. And thus of how well either factor predicts the other. So again, correlation just means a measure of the extent to which two factors vary together. Okay? So what is correlation. So in co a correlation means a measure of the extent to which two factors vary together. Okay? So a statistical measure, which is a co correlation coefficient, helps us to figure how closely two things vary together and thus how well either one predicts the other. Knowing how much aptitude test scores correlate with school success tells us how well the scores predict school success. So a correlation coefficient is a statistical index of the relationship between two things. A statistical index of the relationship between two things. Okay, so if you want to know more about um, statistics and scatter plots and graphs, you know, bar graphs and all that, please view my learning video lecture on statistics. I have a series of um, lectures on statistics.
Okay, so now let's move on to the fun part, <laughs> the experimental uh, research strategy. Okay, so what is an experiment? An experiment is a research method in which an investigator manipulates one or more factors. Now, in this section here, there's much more definitions that you need to learn, okay? And the first being independent variable. So in an experiment, of course, which is a research method in which an investigator manipulates one or more factors, which is the independent variables, to observe the effects on some behavior or mental processes, which is the dependent variable. By random assignment of participants, the experimenter aims to control other relevant factors. So let's, let's evaluate this a little bit more in depth, in depth, because you will need to know what an independent variable and what a dependent variable is, okay? So an independent variable in an experiment, the factor that is manipulated, the variable whose effect is being studied. So in an experiment, you are going to need to know what a dependent variable is and what an independent variable is. So an independent variable in an experiment is the factor that is manipulated, the variable whose effect is being studied. The dependent variable in an experiment, the outcome that is measured, the variable that may change when the independent variable is manipulated. Okay, so let's let's talk more about independent and and dependent variables. There is an even more potent example, okay? And your textbook gives an example in regards to Viagra, taking Viagra, okay? So the drug Viagra was approved for use after 21 clinical trials. One trial was an experiment in which researchers randomly assigned 329 men with erectile disorder to either an experimental group, which are the Viagra takers, or a control group, which were the placebo takers given an identical looking pill, but it wasn't a real pill. So um, a placebo effect is an experimental results caused by expectations alone. Any effect on behavior causes uh, by the administration of an inserts uh, sub substance or condition. In other words, it's a fake pill, it's a sugar pill, okay? So one group of men were given the actual uh, Viagra pill, that was the experimental group. And the control group was given the placebo, meaning the sugar pill, the fake pill, it wasn't the real Viagra pill. So the procedure was double blind. Neither the men taking the pills nor the person given them knew which was which. They didn't know what was being uh, received or, or given, okay? So a double blind procedure is an experimental procedure in which both the research participants and the research staff are ignorant. In other words, they're blind. They don't know um, what they're given. Um, about whether the research participants have received the treatment or the placebo. So they didn't know. 
uh, and this is commonly used in drug evaluation studies, okay? So back to the Viagra study. So the result was at peak doses, 69% of Viagra-assisted attempts at intercourse were successful, compared with 22% of men receiving the placebo. And the placebo is what? The sugar pill, the fake pill, okay? Um, so again, with this sample, um, this experiment manipulated just one factor, the drug, taking Viagra versus a placebo, which is no Viagra. We call this experimental factor the independent variable because we can, we can vary it independently of other factors, such as the men's age, their weight, and their personality. So other factors that can potentially influence a study's results are called confounding variables. Random assignment controls of possible confounding variables. So experiments examine the effect of one or more independent variables on some measurable behavior called the dependent variable because it can vary depending on what it takes um, and what takes place during the experiment. So let, let's, let's do that again. So the dependent variable in an experiment, the outcome that is measured, okay, so it's the outcome that is measured, the variable that may change when the independent variable is manipulated. So both variables are given precise operational definitions, and we know what that is, which specify the procedures that manipulate the independent variable, the exact drug dosage and timing of, uh, in this study, or measure the dependent variable, which are the men's responses to questions about their sexual performance. Now, these definitions answer the quote unquote, what do you mean question with a level of precision that enables others to replicate the study. See, that's, that's the word we talked about at the beginning of this, um, of this, uh, you know, study, study buddy session that we had. Okay, that word replicate. So if you are, let's just say in Florida, you and your research team in Florida and you're conducting this experiment, you have to do everything so precisely, okay? Operational definitions need to be so precise that somebody in, you know, let's just say Germany, you know, or anywhere in Spain or someplace would be able to replicate your research study and come up with similar results. Okay, so in psychological research, just know this, no questions are off limits. Of course, except for untestable ones, okay? Um, we need to compare research methods in any type of experiment. You got to know there's different types of research methods. And we spoke of three major categories. Do you remember what they are? Let me quiz you now. What are the three major types of uh, research methods? Descriptive, correlation, and experimental. So what is descriptive? What is its basic purpose? I'm quizzing you, come on. So the descriptive research method's basic purpose is to observe and record behavior. How is it conducted? It is conducted 
using case studies, naturalistic observations, or surveys. Is anything manipulated? The answer is no. So what about correlational research? What is it? Its basic purpose is to detect naturally occurring relationships to assess how well one variable predicts another. How is it conducted? By collecting data on two or more variables and of course then comparing it. Is anything manipulated? No, you're just collecting the data and you're comparing the results. Okay. Next is experimental. What is its basic purpose? To explore cause and effect. How is it conducted? In an experiment, of course, by manipulating one or more factors and the use of random assignment. And is anything manipulated? Yes the independent variable or variables are manipulated. Okay, uh, one thing that we need to talk about is something that's called informed consent. Okay, so you would need to know the definition of informed consent. And basically it's given potential participants enough information about a study to enhance them to choose whether they wish to participate in that study, okay? So informed consent is given potential participants enough information about a study to enable them to choose whether they wish to participate. What is informed consent? Informed consent is given potential participants enough information about study, about a particular study, to enable them to choose whether they wish to participate. What is informed consent? Informed consent is giving potential participants enough information about a study to enable them to choose whether they wish to participate. Okay, and what is debriefing? Debriefing is the post-experimental explanation of a study including its purpose and any deceptions to its participants. What is debriefing? The post-experimental explanation of a study, including its purpose and any deceptions to its participants. Okay, so there are research ethics involved in uh, these different types of research strategies, okay? And so the ethics code of the APA and also Britain's uh, BPS urge researchers to obtain potential participants informed consent to take part uh, and to protect participants from greater than usual harm or discomfort. And also to keep information about individual participants confidential and to fully debrief people, which is to explain the research afterwards. So ethical concerns are there in regards to psychological research. 
And, you know, there are values in psychology, okay? So values affect what we study, how we study it, and how we interpret the results. Researchers' values influence choice of research topics. Should we study worker productivity of worker morale, sex discrimination or gender differences, conformity or independence? Values can also color the facts. Our observations and interpretations, sometimes we see what we want or expect to see. All right, so this concludes our psychology exam study buddy episode number three, all about research strategies. Now, I will not be doing a study buddy session on statistical reasoning in everyday life, but I do have uh, learning video lectures on statistics to talk about um, describing data, measures of central tendency, measures of uh, variation. I do go over mode, mean, medium, range, standard deviation, and go more in depth in regards to statistics. So go ahead and review those uh, uh, learning lectures. Again, this is Dr. Bev Knox, your study buddy, signing out.